Now, folks, we'll just give it a minute for everybody to filter in and then we'll get started. Okay, I think we have pretty much everybody in now. Um, hello again to everybody. As uh, I'm sure you're all aware now, uh, my name is Michael McLaughlin and I'm a, a lecturer in digital design, digital fabrication in Limerick School of Art and Design. Today, I'm delighted to say that we have Martin McGloin, uh, an Irish designer speaking about the studio that he works for, which is the world renowned uh, Joseph Walsh Studio. Martin was trained as an architect in Dublin School of Architecture. Martin has been lead design developer at Joseph Walsh Studio since 2016. Working with a small group of designers, Martin assists Joseph Walsh in the realization of his work in collaboration with skilled makers and engineers through models, prototypes, and digital media. The Joseph Walsh Studio encompasses a design studio, workshop, gallery, and archive set around the, uh, an 18th century farmhouse in the countryside of County Cork on the south coast of Ireland. Art, craft, design and technical innovation merge in the exquisite and expressive pieces that the studio crafts, opening up new possibilities in material and form. The workshop is one of the leading studio workshops in Europe, attracting the best talent from around the world in various disciplines, including the core areas of woodworking and stone carving. I myself um, have been to the fantastic Joseph Wall Studio uh, for the annual Making In conference uh, on a number of occasions. It's a, a, an annual conference. And um, for anybody who's not aware of the Making In conference, I would encourage you to look it up. Each year, architects, designers, and craftspeople all speak about contemporary making. And even though the Making In conference is extremely inspiring, I distinctly remember driving home for the first year I attended and saying to myself that it would have been absolutely perfect if Joseph had a spoke about his own studio also. Uh, we got to see the workshops and we got to see the environment around, but that year Joseph didn't speak about his own workshop. So I'm actually very excited to hear Martin talk about the work of uh, Joseph Walsh Studio today. So Martin, um, I invite you to, to share your screen whenever you're ready. Um, and I suppose for, for everybody else, uh, it's the same drill as usual. If you want to ask questions, please put them in the Q&A tab and myself and Eleanor will go through them with Martin at the end. Thank you, Martin. All right, thank you. Um, you can see my screen okay now, yeah. Yeah, we can indeed. Um, all right, um, so, uh, Michael will give a pretty good introduction there. Um, my name is Martin McLaughlin and uh, I've worked at Joseph since 2016. I graduated as an architect and um, in 2013. And in the intermediate years, uh, I worked in Germany specializing in, uh, for an architecture office, but specializing in computer modeling and visualization. And uh, then in 2016, I had the opportunity to work with Joseph and I moved back to Ireland. Um, so uh, just put on to my next slide. So I'll just put this in uh, to give a kind of overview of what I'd like to talk about. So I'll, I'll give a quick rundown of the studio. And yeah, I should say actually, um, Michael was saying he had missed uh, Joseph speaking as making in. But um, if you go to our website, we recently launched a, a video, um, a film where, where Joseph is uh, talking about his work and its process and um, really the, the last 20 years of the studio in a way. And that's culminated in a book that we just um, published and it, it's for sale on the website. So I, I, I won't get into the, the more creative side of Joseph's work because um, that's uh, something that he's be better equipped to, to speak about. I'll be talking more about the, the technical side and the use of um, digital tools and digital software. Um, 
So yeah, I'll give a quick introduction to the studio. I'll talk a little bit about Joseph's work from my point of view or uh, as I see it. And um, then a little bit on how, I, how digital tools might fit into that ethos and reflect a bit on conversations that I've had with Joseph in the past uh, on the use of digital tools, because from his point of view, um, he's not so much influenced by digital technology. It's more about uh, nature and processes of making. So you know, I'll go on to the design, uh, the design process of a typical project that, that runs through the studio. Uh, and then in the second half of the talk, I, I took some headings. So I won't really talk about projects from start to finish. I, I, I wanted to pick out specific points in projects where I thought there was an interesting uh, conflict or a uh, junction between the use of digital tools and craftsmanship. So um, yeah, these are the three headings and I, I'll come back to those. So uh, like Michael was saying as well, uh, the campus of the studio is um, kind of centered around uh, uh, Joseph's original family home, which he, he came to in hers. And in the background of this image, you can see um, a what we refer to as the potato shed which is which is the building that i'm uh, in at the moment and this was the first uh place where joseph started making at a very uh, young age um, at 12 he left school and, and and began to make uh traditional irish furniture uh, in this potato shed and now that's become um as, as the company has grown over the last 20 years, uh, it's it's almost become kind of uh, three units. Uh, so we have administration and a gallery function, We have uh, which is shown on the image here. Um, so we have gallery downstairs and some offices upstairs in this image. And then we have the design studio. So you can see myself and my colleague, Andrew here, um, reviewing projects with Joseph. Uh, and then the third part uh, unit of the company, which is really the, the, the key machine of the company is, is the workshop. And since 2019, we have moved into this uh, large warehouse that was refurbished. So it's about 300 meters away from here. And um, yeah, it's been, a, it's, been a, it's been a huge step forward uh, in terms of quality of the environment before all the making happened here in the potato sheds and it was really getting overcrowded with projects on top of projects on top of projects and uh, in 2019 we made uh, quite a big investment to refurb this very large warehouse and, and get it to a, a standard uh, almost the domestic standard of temperature and humidity in order to be able to make uh, to make the the pieces in a controlled environment so um, and during this period, so in, that happened in 2019 and 2020, obviously COVID-19 happened and um, we had a lot of downtime and the makers uh, used that time to develop a best practice document, which we had never really got around to. We had never really got around to uh, putting down in words what it is that we're doing and how we're bringing quality to each step of the process uh, so this break was actually quite a good opportunity so the coupling of these two things um has uh, really elevated the level of work even even in the last couple of years so that's just to give a, a general orientation of the company i guess uh, um, so if I, if I speak a little bit about Joseph's work from my point of view uh, for a second, um, I took some images from this book from Claudia Clement, who, who spoke at uh, the Making In a seminar that Michael was referring to. Um, and because Joseph started with heavily influenced by traditional furniture, and um, when I look at these images, which are kind of uh, furniture typologies from mid uh, 1700s, really, to 1800s, and it's, it's really pre-industrial um, revolution, uh, and the industrial revolution took a, uh, even a longer time to get to the west of Ireland. So 
here I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm from Sligo, so I'm kind of familiar with the background also. But in this part of uh, the world um, at that time, people were really making things out of necessity, functional objects with material that they had to hand. And there's something, you know, it's very honest work, but you, it creates these situations where, you know, if I was to ask you, can you make me a chair? Probably the last material you would think of is straw. But in the, because uh, that's what was to hand, and they, they had the necessity of making a chair, they had to take a base material um, which is very supple and yeah, not the first thing you would think of in making a chair. And they had to have the material perform at this very high level through process. And within that process, they're meticulously looking at uh, kind of how they employ the material, the inter interest, the intricateness of it, and uh, really creating acrobats in the in the process to take a pile of straw and turn it into a functional chair um so to just uh, kind of settle on that point uh on this slide i've shown uh on the left hand side is uh the sligo chair or the tune chair or the Chum chair it's, it's basically a, a medieval three-legged chair that was quite common uh in this area at that time. And on the right, there is a, an early chair from Joseph, which he refers to as Charlie's chair. So you can see that there's a very direct relationship in Joseph's early work between traditional making and traditional topologies and, uh, and his work. Um, so then if I jump to the next slide, you can see that there is this almost uh, this giant jump in topology, which uh, occurred around 2008 to 2010. There was um, a significant exhibition in Chicago where a lot of um, Irish makers uh, exhibited their works. And that was the first time the Enignum series was shown by, by Joseph. But e even when I look at this image, although it is this massive jump, which I, of in creativity that uh, I, I couldn't put into words, uh, Joseph would have to do that. Uh, I still see that kind of the topology or how he's employing the material is about taking a functional object and taking a, a base material or employing a material in, a, in an unexpected way and then really looking at the intricateness of the, the process and the acrobatics you have to perform to get this supple material to do something very functional as in become a, a table you know so and and out of that you you and you result with objects that are um of the material they're not plastic they're of wood because of the way that the wood was employed and they have the mark of the maker on them. And when, if I just think back to the images of showing of, of traditional Irish furniture, that's the same impression that I get from those pieces of furniture. So, um, so this this breakthrough in topology and this breakthrough in uh, how to employ material led to an explosion of lots of different types of projects and employing different materials uh, over the over the 20 years so i'm just i'm running kind of uh, through some examples of those um similar situation here where we're asking a block of connemara marble to um work in tension and compression tension it really doesn't like working in uh so and i'm going to come back to this project uh, a little bit later um so then when the studio is rooted in this uh, ethos of traditional making and it's kind of building on uh, 
traditional craftsmanship and enhancing it. Um, how does digital tools and digital software uh, sit into processes here at the studio? And I took this quote from a, a musician, uh, John Greenwood, because I, I just heard this in an interview and I thought it captured it quite well, um, the conversations that I've had with Joseph on the topic. And uh, I'll just read it uh, quickly, just to everyone. So, um, so it's, it's all technology, I suppose, is what I'm trying to say. It's all, you know, computers and pianos and trying to get them all onto a level field and treat them all equally. In an ideal world, you can use any instrument and any sound and whatever serves the song and the arrangement of the song is all that matters, which is a good, pure motivation to have. So inevitably in this day and age, because digital tools have become so prevalent, it would be ignorant to ignore their uses. So the studio does uh, employ them, but it tries to view them on the same field as any other options uh, in terms of figuring out a project in that uh, Joseph's original intent or the ambition or inspiration that Joseph has for the piece is like the, it's the song or it's the arrangement of the song and how you get there um, isn't important in terms of what tools you employ as long as that uh, when you get there you, you, you get there with kind of a pure motivation of, uh, of, of making the pieces so um, with that said I'll just run through typically uh, how a project runs through the studio. And um, it's often starts here for Joseph with uh, sketching uh, quite loose ideas that are um, constantly reinterpreted then in, in several sketches. And through that process for Joseph, he kind of creates a, a cloud of ideas around a project or a commission. And then he begins to test those ideas in 3D uh, with sketch models. So in this period of the project, which we, we, we call design intent, um, Joseph is creating content to uh, express his idea or his ambition for a piece. So, and then that can go from small models to um, full scale models in, in the same way uh, so in the case of the Enigma, Enigma series, using single veneers and manipulating them uh, to generate the, the forms that he's looking for. And then towards the end of that phase, when the project is for Joseph be beginning to solidify, he makes what we call presentation models, but they could, they could also be referred to as, as technical models where He's um, really laminating veneers and locking in the shape and the intent, uh, showing here uh, the chats with dead um, in context with the, the, uh, the room that it um, was put in. And so this is a picture of the full design team kind of mulling over something complicated. Um, so then Joseph begins to explain the project to us or express it to us. So. Uh, myself and Andrew uh, are the design developers and we're taking Joseph's sketches and his sketch models and we're beginning to start to pull them apart to say, to see um, technically how they're going to work. So we're very clear on what it is we want to achieve, even though it's at that point somewhat abstract uh, through sketches. Um, but then we have to really start looking at it as a series of components that are going to be made. And, and we kind of start taking the poetry out of it a little bit uh, to get down to the practicalities of how it's made. So uh, I just want to show this image. This is like a typical setup of our big, um, with the big uh, whiteboards that you've seen in the background. And there we're constantly posting up sketches uh, of where we're at with the project. 
And I wanted to show these images because you can see here on the right, this is a kind of half uh, clunky rhino model with sketches over it. And then we have full sketches. And on the, the left, we're looking at um, how to install something. So it's sketches and screen grabs from Rhino and things like that. And I suppose what I'm trying to express here is that um, any medium or any way of looking at the project is, is, um, is acceptable just to get to these uh, key pieces of information. Um, and at the same time, so the, the, after design intent, the phase where myself and Andrew are involved, we call technical strategy at the beginning. So part of technical strategy is the sketching that I was just showing. And then at the same time uh, in the workshop, we might be making a prototype to address some specific challenge of the piece. So in this case, we have a table that's uh, mounted on one leg. And on the top, you can see that we made this very clunky, uh, laminated leg uh, to check out, okay, is it going to vibrate? How is this deflecting? Um, how does it feel as a table? But really quickly and just trying to get to the point of um, whether it can be successful or not based on, based on our design. So within the design strategy phase, lots of different mediums are being employed to test um, aspects of the project so that we can report back to Joseph and he can make an informed decision. So, and then after the technical strategy phase, we have um, technical outputs and I've just illustrated that here with some uh, good old fashioned drawings, 2D drawings, because we're dealing with people in the end, not uh, CNC robots or 3D printers, although I will show a, a project that, that was where we employed CNC. Um, and uh, yeah, then on the right, you can see the resulting cabinet there. So, and so even after the technical output phase, when the project is on the floor and it's in the process of being made, there is still scope for design. It's, it's still being reviewed uh, kind of every other day or at least on a weekly basis. And every detail is being looked over by Joseph and even at that stage, uh, yeah, there is there is scope where he might reinterpret the shape or the idea, and uh, reverse work or completely change a detail. And this is really where Joseph is in his elements because this is how he started out. This was the first 10, 12 years of his career before he he um, started to move away and become more of a, a manager than a designer maker. Um, so that, that gives you an idea of, of the, the flow of a project um, through the studio. And now I want to get to um, addressing these headings that I set out. So I just wanted to explain a couple of scenarios where within the technical strategy phase, we began to look at uh, something very specific and had an interesting back and forth between digital software and, and craftsmen and making. So the first example I wanted to show is, is a bench that we, we launched recently with the film. It's, it's called the Gestures Bench. And this piece is made from wood, laminated components here, uh, standing upright. And, but actually the seat part is upholstered and it looks, uh, Pretty seamless in this in this uh, photograph, but there's a transition here from wood to uh, leather. And in the design process, this piece. So I've jumped now to an image of uh, computer rendering. So at this point, we were quite late in the technical strategy phase. We were pretty happy with what we had, because uh, you can see there isn't a huge change here. Um, but there was one unresolved detail and that's how we wanted to achieve the upholstery. So we had an original idea to create this kind of contoured um, flowing uh, lines across the piece and that they would be pleated cushions um, that would create the seat area. And we had a very specific pattern in mind and we were able to model that digitally. So again, these are 
uh, renders. Um, and we were all pretty happy with that. But uh, then we jumped to a, a prototype and in terms of material constraints and digital tools, it's an interesting moment because I can, I can produce the shape I want in the computer uh, easily, uh, kind of. But when I hand it over to an upholster, there is no 2D output that I could have given her in this situation that she could have achieved exactly. So as soon as she starts with the inner contour, and that's what she, she's demonstrating here with this photograph, she, she took my 2D drawing and the grid and she uh, transferred that onto her leather hide. But you can see now the 2D grid is distorted uh, and what's happening and she told us this right at the beginning is that as she's using material, the lines are changing. As I travel from the inside contour to the outside contour, I'm grabbing more and more leather. And now the lines that I, she was given to begin with uh, are gone. They've become distorted in this asymmetrical way by the use of material. So in the end, we went in another direction. Uh, at this point, we, we tried to create something that was more seamless and a very subtle line, as opposed to these very pronounced lines. But um, for a period, um, I'll just have to uh, reset this. So for a period, uh, I, I thought, uh, you know, this is something geometric. So maybe I can draw the end cushions that I want and I can draw the template that the upholsterer would need at the same time. So I uh, developed a script uh, which, which done that for us. It didn't really help us, but I'll just, uh, just play this video to, to illustrate it. So here I'm just showing, I have my contours in Rhino and uh, the script behind is analyzing those contours and building these cushions in between and I can change the height of those cushions. Um, and then on, when I go back to the top view, it'll show, so I have my target cushion geometry on the left and on the right, um, I have the developed template of that and I can play around with that in real time. So I thought this would be a useful tool because I could draw the intended object or assess it and see the repercussions for the maker at the same time. So I'm kind of, it's just a little incident where you could say uh, thinking through making is happening at the same time as designing in a computer. So I, I find that really interesting. And it didn't, it didn't help us on the project because as you see where I end here, uh, let's restate that. But, where, where I end, you can see that um, uh, anything that's convex uh, is fine because you need more, ter more material as you travel out in contours. So you're just grabbing more material, that's fine. Once you move to concave, you have too much material and now you have to try and get rid of it. And there's no way of doing that without really uh, cutting or patching things together, which we, we didn't want to go with in the end. So, um, so that, that was one example, a quick example of looking at material constraints in a computer, thinking through making and uh, designing digitally where they're overlapping. Uh, so, so that would be an interesting example. So if we take that example and then uh, apply it to how we work with veneers in a lot of our work, um, I chose this image here, which I, find, I, I quite like. It's, it's, a, it's a picture taken from my phone of my computer screen of a 3D scan of two people manipulating a veneer. So it's, it's a bad photo in terms of quality, but it's interesting from a technical point of view. So this is um, typically what we do with Joseph's models, physical models. We scan them and then we trace them in Rhino. And that allows us to jump to 3D models quite quickly of the desired shapes. So in this case, 
here Joseph was uh, manipulating, manipulating a veneer and he was explaining to us, this is the type of leg I want to make for this table. And we were able to take that data and very quickly kind of uh, make an array of legs and build out forms uh, for a Liam table. But uh, in the process of doing that, you can see that it's not perfect uh, geometry. And when, so we have some kinks here and even, uh, even if we had quite smooth lines, the relationship between the two black lines, so I'm jumping around a bit now, but the relationship between this black line and this black line, the left and right of the veneer. Um, in reality, the, the relationship between those two lines are uh, bonded together because it's a physical object and uh, it's, a, it's a physical piece. So no matter how you manipulate the veneer in reality, those two lines, the relationship between them is maintained. But in Rhino, you, you end up with this kind of accumulating effect or um, errors. So because the veneers are very supple, no matter how you grab them, you create flats or you create kinks or things like that. And then when you scan it, you inherit those kinks. And then often uh, the scan is not perfect either. And so you have this, this accumulation of errors and when you look to uh, scale up your project and jump to a kind of large magnus shape as we have here, uh, all those discrepancies are amplified again. So this was another situation where the constraints of the material and how it's employed um, is uh, in, in influencing the influencing the shape, but we wanted to see if we could develop a tool that helped us um, work in this way where uh, Joseph was making physical models and we're able to trace them, but that we would have this kind of fail safe um, smoothening tool that maintains the relationship of a physical veneer. So just for a second, I'm gonna jump into just technically uh, what I'm talking about in terms of geometry. So as you bend a sheet material, uh, it assumes these forms in the negative space of the, of the bending. So in the case of bending it around the cylinder, you can see the lines of bending are um, inherited by the, the piece uh, of the sheet material. And in the case of Joseph's work, actually, because of twisting, everything is in this, uh, in this cone shape of bending. So you have a progressive lines of bending. The angles are changing progressively from one twist to the next twist. And in this diagram, this is showing a bad relationship of curves. So you can see that the relationship between the inside or the outside curve and how it's progressively bending is, it looks wrong, it's kinky, and it's, it's not progressing in an equalized fashion, let's say. And we can actually, uh, I did this exercise, which was super tedious, but it was skipping 3D scanning and just recording points X, Y, and Z of bend lines and then transferring that back into the model. So I was getting it more accurate uh, reading of what the, the shape of the geometry was than just a quick 3D scan. Um, so then I, I, so I'll just go back to this slide for a second. So then I asked the same question as I did with the leather material. Can we somehow simulate the performance or the behavior of a veneer, what it wants to do um, in a computer to help us smoothen out these uh, kinks and get rid of this accumulated error effect. So um, I'm just gonna stop sharing for a second. I just wanted to demonstrate uh, quickly uh, what I mean by, by smoothing out. So again, the physical characteristics of the veneer, when I grab it and bend it, 
uh, along this curve, it's trying to equalize itself. So it's not, it starts it starts out as a as a flat, and all the time it's because of the grain direction it wants to get back to being a flat. So when I bend it, um, the geometry is trying to equalize this curve, and when I roll it up into a circle, it creates a circle because a circle is a is an equalized equalized shape. So in a second, just uh, pull this out. So you kind of you kind of get a circle, but you can already see I have some weird points going on here, and that's because that's the point of holding. Or when I double up the material, you can also see that this curve is transitioning at a different rate than this curve. So these are the things that I, I want to teach Rhino, or I want to incorporate. Uh, in my Rhino model. So for that, um, I developed a script which uh, takes two curves uh, again. So I'll just press play on this. And in this video, I'm just showing I'm intentionally making bad geometry out of two curves. And through the script, oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, uh, share it again there. Right. Lovely, thanks. Go back. Uh, that's brilliant yeah we can see it now yeah i'll just start it start the video again um so yeah in rhino on one side of an equalized circle and on the left side i've intentionally drawn two curves which have a bad relationship and when i employ the script the strip uh, kind of opens out and equalizes itself uh, to become a to become a circle so uh, another example of that. Um, so the same principle, but in this version, you can see these dots here. They're positions where I'm holding the veneer intentionally. And when I press play again now in the script, it maintains the position at those points, but the ribbon tries to equalize itself between those points. So when we scale that up to... Um, a Magnus piece. Uh, I have my scanned geometry and I've tr traced my lines, but I can see already here in the center of the screen something weird is happening. And that's that's an obvious version of it, but probably in the rest of the piece there are lots of these little discrepancies. So um, I'll just play this video now and. You can see in, in the red dots there where I'm intentionally holding the piece. So in this case, uh, when I run the software, it just very subtly smooths out those little discrepancies. And that becomes a very useful tool in a way um, when we talk about creating these shapes and other materials that don't have the same inherent resistance as veneers. Um, but even for the existing Magnus pieces, this was very useful because it gave the makers a confidence that when they perform these large laminations, that something that they can't see in terms of kinks or twists aren't hidden in there somewhere. So, um, okay, that was uh, kind of rush through that a little bit in the end, but uh, that was um, material constraints of veneers. So. Coming up on 40 minutes. Um, so under the next heading, I, I want to look at material performance. And I'm going to go back to this stone project, this stone table. So um, if we talk about, again, the Joseph's design intent, which was create a table out of a single block of marble. And we have our process of carving um, and then we have the material performance. So we have these three aspects and I want to look at those three things, bring them together in a way that uh, Joseph can make uh, informed decisions. And then in this case, uh, engineers that uh, we consulted with on this project could also make informed decisions. So we start off with our quarried block of marble, Connemara marble is has an amazing color and texture and character, but the character 
uh, comes from its inherent weakness, which is it is changing densities across the block quite a bit, uh, and you get inherent cracks where um, just other strata of stone are passing through the block. So in this case, it's sitting there as one block, but really, if it comes under any tension at all, there's about four, three or four parts that will um, just want to uh, break away or fall apart. So that's our base material. And then we have uh, Joseph's foam model, which was the, the intent or the uh, target uh, shape that we wanted to produce. So the first step we take in, in, in the technical strategy phase is we scan Joseph's foam model, and then we create a smooth one on surface around the um, Trini scan. And now this is a computer render of um, that Rhino surface. So I'm just showing we've captured a good relationship between the full model and the, the target computer model, let's say. And then in this case, with the um, stone carver and with the engineers, we were able to uh, take a series of photos of the block and dimensions from the quarry without going there. And we were able to survey the cracks that were passing through the block. Um, so then I could build all that information into a Rhino model and we could start looking at the target shape relative to the inherent cracks in the rock and develop a strategy for reinforcing it with um, consultant engineers, which were Arup in this case. Um, so just uh, some images on the reinforcement and you can see travel, the cracks traveling through the piece. So what was important about that was that we could locate the target shape of the table relative to the cracks in a good way that um, reinforcements could would be able to pass through. If we were to move it 200 mil to the left or 200 mil to the right, we would cut off channels that we would be able to use as reinforcement. So that was a, I put that example in because I thought it was a good, a good instance of uh, thinking through making and considering the material uh, and the design intent and being able to bring that all together in, in a computer model and communicate it back to the, the relevant people that were involved um, to make an informed decision. And then I put this slide in, which is an unfinished uh, piece by Michelangelo, where um, you have a block which has been half roughed out and you have the finisher of the um, sculpture is kind of halfway through his work as well. So in the past in Pietro Santa, when all these uh, masters were working out of there, they, they would assign two different people to carving uh, figurines. And the first person was a rougher who would just rough out a general shape and that general shape was um, it was it was described as bring, giving life to the stone. That you're you're in a way you're already setting out the pose of the figurine just by reading the block and saying, okay, there's a crack here, so I'm going to take off a piece, and it it creates the boundary for the the finishing carver to go in and create the detail and ultimately the pose of the figurine. So I think, it, I think it's uh, interesting uh, just to note. So as I jump on to the next slide, uh, the, this table was actually CNC'd to this point from the stone. So in this instance, uh, myself and the engineers and the stone carver involved, we were kind of treating ourselves as the, the first rougher uh, giving life to the piece that we were able to assess the stone and take it to a point um, so that it could perform its, its, its duty of creating the, the, the final shape. Um, and these are just uh, kind of the finishing work then came after that. 
uh, and voids were created in the table and things like that by uh, resident stone carver, um, which was separate separate process. Uh, so this is quite a quite a distance to travel from where it's roughed out in the CNC down to the the finished surface. But on this project, we we felt that employing CNC to do this roughing part was just uh, a good uh, an efficient way of doing it. If we could ask a stone carver, and we have on a similar table, to remove all the material down to this point and find this way into the block. But we found that that had too much of uh, an influence on the final shape and the design intent from Joseph. So in this case, this was a, an example of employing a digital tool in a way that would in, enrich the pro project and uh, maintain Joseph's um, original uh, intent. So um, I'll finish on this one, I think, because of uh, just 15 minutes. Um, so again, looking at material performance with um, Magnus and we're uh, back to veneers again. So in this case, when we, we look at the base material, it's um, how it's processed uh, informs how it behaves structurally. So how, it, how you cut it and uh, uh, process it to produce veneers or, or boards has a large impact on um, how it performs as a final structure or, or object. And in engineering, wood is a bit of a, it's a bit of a gray area because um, it's very inconsistent material. It's, um, and when you see structures like glue lamp beams over swimming pools or something like this, They've been engineered probably to three or four times the depth because nobody wants to take the risk of making it uh, too small. So when engineers are confronted with wood, they just tend to blow everything up to be safe because when you have knots and the cellular structure of grains, it's not homogenous like steel or like plastic. So they have no real way of doing the numbers on it. So on the Magnus series, when Joseph approached Arup to create, to scale up the projects to this large, um, large format, the big question was, how can we tell how the material is going to perform? And Peter Flynn, who was director of Dublin and Arup, took the approach that basically we need to go back and develop the mats for your product, your way, uh, when, uh, Joseph's way of, of um, employing the material and laminating, in the, laminating it in this way with this with uh, ash and um, the types of glues that he's using it. So we need to we need to make our own Young's modulus for what a beam would do uh, in this product because if we turn to the industry uh, and look for the modulus there, we will just end up making this big, fat magnus. It will look elegant and it, it will be an interesting object. So in 2015, 2016, just as I was starting at the studio, uh, we, under, we underwent these uh, tests, which were set out by Peter. So here at the bottom, you can see the sketch. And this test were basically turning a beam, a laminated beam, like a, like a door handle, just grabbing it at the end and pulling it down. And we're tracking points on the end of the beam to see how it uh, deforms over a certain weight. And then we had another test module, which we called the hockey stick test. Uh, and it's, it's the same idea, checking strength in bending and strength in torsion. Um, this one was actually a test of, uh, of a base for the National Gallery piece, um, one to one test. And again, just testing it in X, Y axis and ways to see how it deforms. That's Peter Flynn there in the background conducting the test. Um, his real hands on approach to, to uh, this like, empirical testing. So. Um, so from, from that information, then, 
Arup are able to take those numbers and feed them into our computer model. So, and from that, they're able to look at how the piece is going to behave. And when they start to see something that's very worrying, so they're, they're on the same page, they want to get the material to perform at its highest level, but when they see something worrying, then they have to give us feedback on, okay, we need this section. If the section was a little bit thicker, or if this section was a little bit more narrow, we would get less wind loading. And here we could you know, flatten out a, a, a stress point if we just had a little bit more thickness. So in, in the process of developing Magnus, we were doing these tests. We were sending Arab um, shapes that we wanted to achieve. And then they were giving us feedback in terms of deflection and, and loading on the shapes. And that, that process was kind of a, a cycle that occurred several times over, over a couple of years to get to a finished Magnus. And within that time, uh, developed another uh, grasshopper script, which allowed me to play around with the thicknesses on a given shape um, on, on the fly. So I just wanted to show that. And I, I suppose what's interesting in this uh, instance is if you can read the titles of my sliders, they're in the language of the makers here at the studio. They're talking about uh, build-ups of thicknesses and uh, pinch width is what we call this uh, thin flat seam that travels around the piece. Um, so I'm able to change the, the makeup of the geometry on the left-hand side in the maker's terms. And then on the right-hand side, you can see I'm, I'm deforming this uh, shape. Sorry, that went a little bit quick. So I can probably stand up and just run it again. Um, so that was just another instance of, um, yeah, looking at material performance, the target shape, and then the process of the maker and bringing all those things together uh, in one model so everyone can kind of, well, back then, crowd around the computer and really hash out uh, some bigger decisions uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on the project. So I think I'm going to have to... Uh, so, sorry, so I, I can go a little bit further. Um, after the piece is made, then the Arabs' predictions, we, we scanned the piece several times uh, over the next six months to a year. And from that, um, we could relate their predictions to what actually happened in real life. So it's just another instance of using uh, digital tools. So I think, I, I think I'm gonna have to leave it there. I have a couple of more things, but uh, we're, we're kind of coming up to the end of the time and I'll, I'll probably go over if I keep going. So uh, I think I'll end it at that, if that's all right. That's brilliant, Martin. Thank you very much. Um, it's brilliant to get such a, a practical insight into the, the studio. Uh, we might give it five minutes now to give you a rest from speaking. Yeah. And grab, yeah. grab a cup of tea and we'll come back in five minutes. So we're at right. 1654 Great. now, so we'll be back at 1659. Great. Thank you. All right.
Hey Martin, welcome back. Yes, Good. Um, <clears throat> there's a few questions coming in there from the audience that we'll get through. Um, but before we start in with them, um, there's a couple of questions I wouldn't mind asking if that's all right. Yep. <clears throat> I, I know that like you only joined in the, the studio in 2016, but and and since 2016, I think the the studio has like a, a global audience, you know, it's been very well known. But back in the you know the first days of uh, when Joseph was making stuff twenty years ago, do you know how he originally would have picked up his commissions? How that developed and became because you can see that the way you explained at the beginning, you could see the you know the, the chairs developing more and more and to become the style that it is now. But how originally was he able to get the commissions to to build up that profile? Um, well, the commissions for, so from from speaking to Joseph it was very much. Uh, people in the locality that he knew that needed a set of tables and chairs. And at that time, he was fulfilling uh, a commission just as simply as that. And then I, I, I spoke uh, with a client to this uh, at one point and he, um, he commissioned the, a cabinet uh, with Joseph and they had arranged a you know, a timeline and what the cabinet was going to, going to be. And then the client explained to me that there was a point where Joseph just wasn't happy with it. And actually he took, he took it back and he said, no, I, I, I'm not going to charge any more or anything. I just want to take the time to really elevate this, uh, the design of this cabinet. So within those points so it's let's say how, how, how do you build up to these larger commissions it's really through hard work and taking 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 this point of saying no i there is a, a level of quality and a level of ambition that i want to achieve and maybe i only have a commission for a certain amount of money on this cabinet but i'm, I'm just going to throw everything i have at it and those periods where he did that on the way up to um, some of the larger breakthrough commissions. And uh, so hard work is the answer there. <laughs> yeah, I, I suppose, would, it be, would I be right in saying that even though there was people commissioning him from for all different things uh, um, in different ways and for different prices all along, he had a sort of, or and still has a, a sort of a design intent of his own that was being influencing each piece and developing his own design intent all the way along and that's yeah. what has become you know the the pieces now that he that ye make exactly yeah exactly so um i suppose each each commission is is based on a relationship between joseph and the clients through numerous conversations and then the idea builds out of that so um Yes, it, the, the ideas and the design intents are, are a very personal thing because, you know, we don't have a huge over um, turnover of clients. So Joseph is working within a, a group of people that he knows very well and has developed relationships with them over the years. And that's, that's part of the thing that has allowed the projects to grow because as people are and clients are really fulfilled and are brought along on the journey of creating something, they come back. <laughs> so, yeah, that's... Uh, Would I be right in saying that the, the scope of the materials that you use is quite small as well, so that you get to know the materials really, really well and are able to develop them really well then also? Yeah, yeah, that's definitely an aspect of it. And also um, being able to own the production of a piece is key in how you manage how much time you invest in it. So the, you know, it's very difficult. You, you have to grow to a very big size to say, okay, I'm going to have a bronze foundry and a wood workshop and a stone carving area. So um, we, we've managed to keep uh, stone and, um, and wood in house uh, completely and we've started to move into metals and things like that and we're going through a phase of getting to know people doing lots of projects with them and trying to work up a relationship and a knowledge of the material as well so it's um, yeah a bit of both yeah but most or maybe all of the timber work would be done in-house would that be right 
Yep, all, all, all of this is, is in that large uh, large warehouse. So we have um, we have we have a, a rougher um, warehouse where we do a lot of the heavy machining, and then the one that I was showing there uh, at the beginning of the talk is is the the carpenters workshop where the a nice work. polished floor. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A very clean workshop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But even even when we were down here and we were all on top of each other. Um, we still kept a very uh, clean machine room. So, uh, sorry. Speaking of wood production, someone has just turned on a chainsaw there. I'm, <laughs> to, uh, I'm going to have to close the window. Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, uh, makes it authentic. It's good. <laughs> Um, I really appreciated you bringing us from the straw chair to your method of making, or like as a, a narrative. I, you couldn't have been clearer on what you were doing. Um, it's kind of, yeah, very good storytelling there. Um, there must be a certain level of doggedness to make a material do do that you know to do what it probably isn't necessarily wanting to do you know making stone work in tension making wood seem to defy gravity um can, as a maker can you <laughs> can you uh talk about that yeah i suppose um there's something the the thing that we're not very good at showing and i suppose all all makers and all designers don't like showing mistakes and failures <laughs> in order to get to uh to a magnus you have to do a lot of a lot of failing so i i showed the test pieces there um thankfully they worked quite well we we, we had uh, i can't say it was seamless but we we had a, a very good understanding of the material within the studio by the time we were by the time joseph was considering making them as large things um but in other instances, we've had situations where our engineers spec a test and they arrive in and just destroy everything in front of them. And then everyone goes back to the drawing boards. Uh, but even, even on the design side as well for Joseph, um, he will go through iterations, make full suites or completely finish a chair and then decides, nah, it's, it's not, it's not what I wanted or expected and it goes on the shelf and it gets replaced. Um, we just start from scratch again. And that's happened numerous times since I've been there. So it's similar to the situation I described with the cabinet where it's um, taking that moment to say, okay, I've, I want to achieve something of a certain quality here. And um, it's first attempt has failed. So I need to go back to the start here. Yeah, so. Um, there's another, it's probably a design question, um, but it was more to do with the spaces. And I was, I was actually, I wasn't surprised when I saw the model uh, that was showing the kind of really sculptural bed in the, the space it's supposed to house. Because um, it kind of reminded me of, you know, when the Guggenheim in Bilbao was built, you know, Richard Serra was the only one that was making sculptures even big enough to... <laughs> To, to fit in there, it became its own sort of language of sculpture. Do you find the same with, with, with the pieces you're making that they're either affected by this, you know, they take the context into the design or the design affects the context in some ways? Yeah, yeah. So, so again, um, the, the relationship Joseph has with his clients, um, you know, it's, it's within their private homes. So they, they, have, uh, they have a large influence on uh, what it what it is they're they're looking for to a degree, um, but the the spaces that they're living in, yeah, obviously um, massively uh, affected. So the, the well, this is on the on the public side. I was going to get to um, the National Gallery, but uh, the National Gallery Magnus piece we did in Ireland, and uh, that that um, proposal actually started out at about. Uh, two and a half, three meters uh, on a podium. And um, when Joseph did the first side visit of uh, what Hennig, Hennig and Bain were trying to achieve within this refurbished um, atrium, um, he seen the like scale of the space and 
you know, it was obvious it couldn't be two and a half, three meters. So we had to go back to the drawing board and, and that really became this first freestanding Magnus. Uh, so it was, a, it was a giant leap from the original proposal, just from the influence of the space. So it's one example. Bed is another good example as well, yeah. How many uh, people as part of the team, Martin? It seems like there must be huge amounts of people working there, but I imagine that um, during a big project, you need lots of people, but then is there times when there's like a, a lull period where there's less on and, and is, is there people coming and going or what way does it work? No, it's um, right now, I would say we're, uh, I think we're at 17, 18, something like this. And half of those people are administration and design. So um, right now we have only about 10 or 11 dedicated makers. Uh, so yeah, again, it's it's not um, high turnover of pieces. So, and also the type of projects we're doing, you can't throw six people at it. You, you have to have two, you know, you have to have a, a senior maker and a, a not junior maker, but, you know, two people at comparable levels uh, that really get into it and have a good working relationship with each other. Um, yeah, throwing more people at it doesn't really solve the problem. So that that leads to we, we've quite long leading times for projects. So because our, our turnover is, is relatively low, let's say. But it also keeps the team tight and focused, and it means uh, things don't. Um, no. Joseph is able to. Uh, you know, keep a, an overview of what everybody's doing. It doesn't want it to explode into into a huge production. Yeah, and I suppose that all of that knowledge has been gained is is held within that community rather than being lost by people going away after working there for a while. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And we we just recently started. Uh, well, we're we're almost developing an apprenticeship program. Uh, so we have two apprentices in at the moment, and the idea is to. Um, build instead of people coming and going for six months or three months or something like that to um, get people to dedicate three years to to um, working in a kind of learning capacity through the workshop. So um, really getting back to what apprenticeships used to be um, rather than people moving around and collecting half bits of information and not, not, not really learning. So. Your, your own background, Martin, I know you said you're an architect um, or trained as an architect. Were you always involved in furniture? Or did you always have an interest in furniture or is that something that just came um, I can say I had an interest in it, but I was really just, uh, I went from hand drawings to computer drawings uh, to where I am now with Joseph, which is a little bit of model making and things like that. But uh, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of... Um, uh, the antithesis of a lot of the other people that are working here, they're very much hands-on and um, trying to solve everything within a computer. And that leads to conflict and exchange. And it's like a good, uh, it's a good kind of back and forth. So, yeah. And the rest of the team, would you say they're all carpenters or joiners um, or do they come from different backgrounds? Uh, so right, right now in design, um, is myself, Andrew, who is also an architecture graduate, and Ortons, who is a graduate from Eindhoven uh, University, so in design and art. Um, and then outside us, uh, on the making side, um, we have uh, largely cabinet makers, um, and for a while we had a lot of uh, french french makers that uh, were part of this uh, like maker skills in france and this um, this process of going from workshop to workshop over seven years uh, and there's no real curriculum or sit down exams or anything like that so you just you just work with different people at different times and you work under a companion uh, within that workshop and then after the seven years they pick one of the workshops that they, they spend some time at. And so one of our lead makers is part of that now, Remy, who's responsible for the National Gallery making and, and 
some of the more recent Magnuses. Um, so he would have trained here for some time and then after a couple of years came back with us. Yeah. And he's been here for 10 years now. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, we have a couple of questions from um, the the audience. Um, I'm going to start at the bottom because uh, sometimes we don't get to the end question, so I'm going to work the other way around first. Um, so this is from Andy Marsden. He says, thanks, Martin. Amazing work. How do you control possible faults developing with pieces from fluctuations in humidity, temperature, once they've left your studio workshop? Uh, yeah, so that's uh, yeah, that's um, so that's a challenge we're always dealing with. Um, but really, the only solution in the end uh, was the work we did in 2019 to refurbish this um, large warehouse. So if 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 your intention is to put a piece of furniture in a domestic home where you have 20 to 30 degrees and you know 40 percent relative humidity then your best bet is to make at that in those conditions so that when it travels it doesn't have any shock um, and we just try and be careful with how we're packing it and, and things like that but that, that that was the big big jump in in progress in that area for us was just the environment in which we're making if that's at a high quality or as high quality as a house then you're not going to get this uh, jump between two different uh, scenarios. And yeah, we consider when we're on the technical side, when we're giving briefs over to the workshop, we'll, we'll mark on it what part of the world it's going to. And then they will start to infer, it'll, it'll at least inform them uh, how they want to treat it or how they, you know, as they check the, the moisture content of the wood, they're, they're kind of keeping an eye on where they want it to be at the end when it's finished making. So, yeah. I have a question here from Benita. Um, regarding the tolerances of the veneer, how do you input make allowances for that in CAD? For example, you spoke about allowing the kinks, etc. but can it also learn the breaking point of the material and how you, far you can push it? So I suppose, are you modeling that within Rhino to understand when the material will break? Um, no, it's, it's, it's not so much about or the, the way we're looking at it or working with it now at the moment. It doesn't incorporate if it's going to bend or maybe even if, it, yeah, if, if the radius is too tight or something like that. All that's inferred in reality with uh, veneers. So... By the time Joseph gets to creating a sketch model or a presentation model, that bit of information is already there. So when we're on the design side and we start looking at it in CAD, um, we're just yeah looking at this smoothing smoothing effect. Um, we're just working out smaller discrepancies, and uh, that seems like a kind of small thing, but. Uh, it really has a big effect when you when you get to the larger works because the information we're handing over from the design studio is on, on that large of a scale, you can't relate to it anymore in terms of resistance and material. It's you need several people lifting and pushing and things like that. It's not you've lost the, the touch that you have when you're just making one veneer on your own. So the reason we developed uh, that script um, to smooth everything out was really about giving the makers confidence that they're not going to laminate something big and there's going to be a kink in it in the end, you know. So, um, but uh, yeah, yeah. So they're 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 almost separate separate things. What the material wants to do is is learn with real models, and then uh, CAD is just about refining the outputs, and then. Uh, assessing shapes in terms of performance and deflection that's all with Arab and that's almost a separate process again so different people at different times in the project yeah mm -hmm. um uh, charlie blackburn says um i loved seeing the connection to traditional irish furniture does the studio have a relationship to the source location of the raw materials used um, is there a lot of waste? There's a lot of questions here. So I'll go through them and then I can remind you. Is there a lot of waste? How do you feel about that? And is the studio active in promoting sustainability within the use of natural resources? 
Yeah, so uh, that's a so good question. And our clients often have that question as well um, because they're investing quite a lot into, into a project and they want to, they want to know if, if it's uh, ethical, let's say, in, in how it's been processed. So the majority of uh, wood we're using is ash, of course, and right now, or well, in recent years with ash, we have this issue of dieback, which is yeah. a disease that's basically uh, annihilating ash trees. Um, so in terms of sourcing woodland management within Ireland, um, is is not really they're not really focused on creating long term uh, projects of um, developing forests like older forests. They're more focused on uh, pine and uh, kind of non native species actually, and but fast growing and high turnover and things like this. So even though it's a state funded governments, they're actually quite commercially driven, which is odd for Joseph, and he's, he's quite a lot of uh, views and thoughts about that. So when we come to source of material, we have to go to the continent, and uh, we, we source our logs from France, and they're processed there. Um, the ethical issue of waste and consumption is, you know, <laughs> The projects that we're dealing with is a group of people putting a lot of energy into one table. And that one table goes to one client and it stays there and is handed over to their next generation and next generation. And the intent is that you, okay, you're putting a lot of energy and, and uh, knowledge and expertise into one thing, but you really want that one thing to go on for hundreds of years. So in terms of like ethical use of material and turnover of projects, we're, we're in a quite a good position in, in relation to other companies or, um, you know, more commercially driven uh, industrial uh, design studios, let's say, or outlets. So I know that's not a, uh, it's not a total answer, but um, I think that, that makes complete sense uh, yeah. that, you know, in no way is the things that you're designing and making uh, short term or disposable. There are things that are going to last maybe hundreds, maybe even thousands of years. Some of them could last and timber can if you look after it in that way. And yeah. as you said, all that energy that goes into it is going to last that amount of time or that material, you know, that embodied energy of bringing ash from France is in that piece. But if, as long as it lasts a long time, it's okay. Yeah. Well, actually, I, I was curious myself because I have a forestry right next door to me here. Um, and the front part of it, again, is that kind of aesthetic of ash with the, all the spruce behind it. Um, but the ash, I couldn't see how you'd make anything out of it. It's it's literally. Yeah, yeah that's that's this. Uh, it, they put a kind of aesthetic border around um, uh, the pine trees yeah, in Ireland. Yeah. It's so, actually very sad that you have to go to French because uh, it, it's probably one of the most well-known Irish trees, you know. <laughs> yeah, so like, yeah, Joe would, arc, or just would artic, articulate this uh, more so than me because he has quite strong views on, on forestry and uh, how that's being dealt with in Ireland and uh, privately he's uh, working on how he might do it. Uh, and, and trying to create a situation where we're almost self-sufficient in terms of uh, produce and, and try to add something or elevate something to like the the discipline of, of forestry and, and developing trees. He's not quite there yet, so uh, but maybe in the next 20 years or 50 years, <laughs> we'll start making with our own trees. Yeah. It's a very well. That's the thing about trees, right? You have to be long term. They don't grow overnight. So, <laughs> um, so Noel Donlan um has a question for you. Does Joseph use clay as a maquette, especially for say the Connemara table? Um, we've, we've yeah, we've done some uh, some models with clay. Uh, was actually relating to to bronze work. Um, that hasn't been published yet. On the um, on the sun side, it's it's usually super quick with uh, kind of 
low density form because it, with it, there's lots of iterations. So you want to do like five models in a short amount of time uh, rather than spend a long time on one model. So in the, in the case of that, I, I don't know, maybe you noticed, but as I flick through the uh, images of the table, it's not the same in each slide. The shape is changing a little bit. And that's because when we, during the process of uh, the design intent of that project, let's say there's maybe seven or eight shapes of tables. Some that were close to each other and some that were very different. So yeah, very quick work in M4. There's a, another quite practical question here from Roland Smith. Uh, when laminating, do you color the glues to match the material to hide the layers when you scope them? Yes, yeah, so the, the glues were using our drying clear. So anything uh, anything in white, um, we're, we're not doing anything. Then on the darker ones, depending on, on the tone dark, we, yeah, we could add uh, dye, but um, in, in the case of some of the super black polished finishes, the, the stains we're using are totally penetrating glue and wood. So in the end, you're getting a, you're getting a, um, a black object. Um, Elke Weston, well, has two questions. So I'll ask you kind of them both at the same time. Uh, just really on the position of Joseph within the organization, I suppose, you know, you have so many designers um, and makers and computer modeling and so on, just kind of what is his role in that? Um, and then um, how many pro projects are you normally working on at the one time within the studio? And are they mostly single commission pieces? So a lot to digest there. <laughs> yeah, so mostly single commission pieces at any one time. It could be between because because our lead-in times are very long. You end up with this situation of like if you take one point over two or three years, you're looking at a lot of projects because projects will go from nine months to eighteen months to twenty-four months. So at any one time, yeah, forty, fifty, something like this that we could be touching on. Um, Sorry, I don't remember the rest of the, the rest of the question. Uh, just just uh, Joseph and how, I suppose. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. So, at this point. Um, yeah, so uh, the way Joseph has grown, the, the studio is, um, it, it, it's happened quite organically in terms of he was a single person in a, in a workshop working on his own. So every time he added people, the roles that they were doing was something he would have done before, but he, he wants to get through more work. So he adds more people. And even in the case of design at the time, like before I'd been to this, the studio, he had looked at uh, design tools and CADs. And he, so um, I suppose the point I'm getting to is basically everything that everyone is doing here, Joseph has done at some point for himself and that's why the, the studio has only grown to a certain point because um, he hasn't really pulled it apart where he's unaware of what's happening in any area. It's, a lot of art studios kind of work in that way because every, so much is um, based on concept and um, the vi singular vision of one person. So they have a, a kind of a natural scale. Um, in terms of his role then is he's basically uh, coaching or managing each person in their position based on his own knowledge of when he had to do it for himself. So that's why, yeah, I suppose when I was going through the slides, um, yeah, showing him uh, on the floor, going through the project, maybe towards the end and the finer parts. But really, the way we're working is we're reviewing everything on the floor every other day. So um, and designs every other day. So it's is really highly involved. I suppose is what I'm getting getting to. So yeah, a lot of people. I think we'll uh, we'll just ask you one more question, and we'll let you go, Martin. Um, Yourself, I suppose when, you, when you're talking about Joseph there, you, he's gone through all those roles and he understands all of those 
different uh, methods of working and different mediums of working. Have you been able to, when, since you've joined Joseph Walsh, have you been able to work like and build some things as well? Or are you always based behind the computer doing digital analysis? Um, no, I, 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 it's, you only have so much time and to, to work as, to work at a certain level, like, uh, for me, it's the the makers that are here are a million miles away from where I am in terms of making, mm-hmm. and and I'm a million miles away from where they are in terms of CAD work and things like that, and yeah, it's uh, there's only so much time I, I it, even yeah to 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 take time out to try and make something here would be almost laughable from my point of view because <laughs> you're you're in this context of people that are really at the top of their game and so you're just saying okay this is the thing that i'm good at and i, I want to contribute with that with that skill set so i suppose you're, you're working so closely with them like both in proximity and you're meeting them every day and talking about the projects that you get to know what they're capable of doing and they they understand what you're capable of doing as well yeah, I mean, we learn so much from each other that allows the work to go uh, more smoothly. But we can never say that we fully understand both sides. And that, that in a way, is kind of important because when you get a group of people together, that's what you want. You don't want everybody knowing the same thing. You want different people that uh, are playing off each other. Um, so... In that respect, yeah, there's always a good dynamic, uh, you know, uh, so, yeah. It's, it's, I, think, I think, Eleanor, we've gone through all the questions that came in, have we? You're silent, Eleanor. <laughs> I was telling a really good joke. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we've, we've got through everything there. Um, yeah. Thanks very much, um, Martin. That was, yeah, that was, that was fantastic, Martin. Thank you very much. Um, and we hope you join us for the rest of the series as well. There's loads yeah. of, uh, you'll see the messages coming in there, Martin. There's loads of thanks and, and it was a brilliant talk. So thank yes. you very much. And uh, everybody listening, we'll see you on Tuesday again next week for our next talk. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Take care. Good luck. Bye-bye. Bye. bye, bye.